Disclaimer. This podcast is not suitable for children. We do curse and talk about very adult topics. We also talk about darker topics with a sense of humor, but are by no means making light of those who experience any sort of trauma and have no intention of offending. All sources for research will be in the podcast episode description, wherever you may be listening. Thanks for your time. And the dog hair is free. Okay. Good morning. Why do you have a quilt? What? Why do you have a quilt? Because I'm cold. Oh. I'm cold too. Did you see? I <laughs> I have a robe on and then I have a secondary bigger robe on over my legs over only. Legs. Yes, I did see that. And then I have another little lap blanket on top of me. Very good. Uh, what have you brought me? What do you have? So we went to the antique store the other day, which is one of my favorite activities when I have the energy for it mm -hmm. is just to like go to an antique mall mm -hmm. and rummage through everything mm -hmm. just to see what I can find. <laughs> I'm never looking for anything specifically. I'm just looking to see what I can find. Um, and in one of the booths um, that actually has a lot of like uh, fashion stuff, they have a lot of like fur coats and the whole thing was 70% 70 70 off. But they have a bunch of like random books, mm -hmm. a lot of yearbooks, which I'm like, who's buying yearbooks? <laughs> Why would you put a yearbook I, in an antique There were store? multiple booths with yearbooks. I Maybe it's like a thing in the antiquing mm -hmm. world, but like so many yearbooks. I'm like, why? But um, I guess maybe if you found like a famous person. Like, I don't know. From like the 40s or the 50s? Like, who are you looking for? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways i found this book called barlow's guide to extraterrestrials um and i saw it and immediately picked it up i didn't look in it i didn't read the subtitle i didn't read nothing other than barlow's guide to extraterrestrials and it had like a little like collage of a couple of the aliens so i picked this up thinking that this was going to be like a um like a collection of like close encounters mm -hmm. type things like aliens that people have seen through like maybe like abductions or dreams or whatever like real life encounters and then they've explained what they saw to an artist and then the artist like rendered it mm -hmm. that's what i thought that would make sense <laughs> but this is actually like after doing the research for this this is this is a pretty like intense piece of like sci-fi history sci-fi fiction well not sci-fi fiction but like the sci-fi like reading community mm -hmm. like, this is a really big piece of art this is mm -hmm. a really big piece of, of work in that community um so it's it was pretty much like published by ian summers mm -hmm. um while the artwork and all of the like nitty-gritty stuff was done by wayne douglas barlow Who's Ian Summers? Well, I'll get I'll get there. <laughs> Relax. Who is he? Okay. Who is he? Relax. Oh, really quick note. Um, the font in this book that everything is like written in, mm -hmm. it's called um, ITC. Oh shit! I I looked up how to pronounce this. <laughs> Benguiat. <laughs> Bengu Benguiat. <laughs> what is it? Let me see it. Benguiat. <laughs> ben right Where is it? Benguiat. <laughs> ben. Benguiat. Benguiat. <laughs> Benguiat. No, it's Benguiat. I think. Ben <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Correct us in the comment. Um. But anyways, I fucking love that font. Mm -hmm. it's so cool. Mm -hmm. Um. It is a decorative serif typeface designed by Ed Benguiat. Released by the International <laughs> Typeface Corporation, which is what ITC stands for, mm -hmm. um, in 1977. Uh, face, the face is loosely based on typefaces of the Art Nouveau period, but is not considered an academic revival. Mm -hmm. That is all from Google. Thank you, Google. Um, if you don't know what it visually looks like, mm -hmm. think of the Stranger Things logo. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
That's fitting for the show. Probably why they chose it. Well, yeah, a lot of, I think a lot of books use that font. Mm -hmm. um, meaning like the covers of sci-fi novels mm -hmm. use that font. Gotcha. Um, there is um, an introduction, there's a preface, real short, couple paragraphs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really where I got a lot of my like information to start off researching Wayne Barlow and Ian Summers. Mm -hmm. um, but then after that point, it's basically just each each spread is an alien and it has the name of the alien. Um, it has the book that the alien is from because that's really what this is, is that this book is a collection of aliens from um, sci-fi novels of the time. Oh, interesting. Um, so it's like, a, it's like a bestiary for all yeah. of those sci-fi Yeah classics um so name book that it's from and then it's got like a couple of like little things like a little description some of them have like ways that they reproduce some have like things about their culture depending on i guess what's available in the like novel that they're from yeah and then it's got like a fully rendered like head to toe of what the alien creature looks like mm-hmm and then in the very back of the book, there is um, a couple of pages that are just like sketchbook pages from Wayne Douglas's um, hmm. like sketchbook in developing this book. So before we go into who they are, I just want to quickly touch on like how they met and how this book started to be developed. And mm -hmm. then we'll go into like who they are. Um, just because like I think in a storytelling way it'd make more sense to do that than to just be like, who are these people? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the book was created both by Ian Summers and Wayne Barlow to showcase Barlow's artwork. Um, Ian Summers was the executive art director at Ballantine Books Publishing Company, later bought out by Random House. Um, and when Barlow was 18, he brought his portfolio to the recommendation of a colleague of Summers. Mm. Um, Summers was super impressed um, and about two years later, they were working together to create this book. Um, this book was nominated for the American Book Award and the Sci-Fi Community's Hugo Award. Hugo. Also chosen Best Illustrated Book of 1979 by the Locus Awards and Best Book for Young People by the American Library Association. Um, they sold nearly 400,000 copies in multiple languages, and it's considered a contemporary sci-fi classic. So that's why I like picked up this book and I was like, oh, it's not real. And, and then I like started researching it and it was like, oh, this is like a treasure piece mm -hmm. for the sci-fi sci community. Maybe mm -hmm. not like a treasure piece. Like maybe I shouldn't put it like on that much of a pedestal. But like after reading and doing the research, I was like, oh, dang, like I picked something real cool. Like, mm -hmm. And I don't even read sci-fi. <laughs> right. I just got this book of aliens now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, yeah, who's who is Wayne Barlow? Um, just a quick note, I'm going to go a little bit more into Wayne Barlow than I am Ian Summers, just because like this book is really meant to showcase like his work. Mm -hmm. Um, but also there's not a lot about Ian Summers and like, I just couldn't be ours to find more. Mm -hmm. Um, he is an American science fiction and fantasy writer, painter, and concept artist. He's born January 6th, 1958, um, which I think means he's a Capricorn. Mm -hmm. Um... His parents are Cy and Dorothea Barlow, who also illustrated animals for the natural history books. So a family hmm. of artists. Nifty. So, you know, of course, being in that environment, he became involved in studying animals and eventually would work for the Natural History Museum in New York. Hmm. I was reading some stuff about, like, how he illustrated, like, a book of bugs at one point, I think, mm -hmm. um, which is, like, super cool. Um, that's not too far a leap for science fiction stuff too, because a lot of bug illustrations in general look pretty alien. Mm hmm. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. He, he credits a lot of his, like his understanding of like animal anatomy and biology and like ecology and mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff from his like parents and his upbringing and like being so involved in learning that and seeing mm -hmm. his parents do it, which I can, I can relate Mm -hmm. too in a in a way i think we can all relate to like we look up to our guardians and 
I'm like, that's fucking cool. I want to do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So then, you know, like he takes this and he's like really fucking good at it. And then he like kind of like not in a bad way. Like, I don't want to be like, oh, and then he turns left. Like, I don't mm-hmm. mean that in a bad way, but a lot of his works um, focus on esoteric landscapes and creatures such as citizens of hell and alien worlds. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, just really loved writing about hell. Mm-hmm. Just like really like dug hell and like red things. That's all in the same like fantasy vein though. Like aliens oh, and yeah. like demons and whatever else. It's all in the same like can't uh, logically explain modern science can't logically explain those things so you know you Mm -hmm. gravitate towards those things because they're interesting that would be at least what my explanation for such a phenomena i would be i honestly couldn't tell you like he went from like little woodland animals and all of a sudden it's like the devil because woodland animals (laughs) are boring (laughs) yeah they're cute and cute's boring so if you would like to see some of his hellacious art and I only mean that in the best way possible. Um, you can see his website, waynebarlow.com. Hmm. Um, it's got all of his like accolades and all of his artwork and all of the stuff that he's published. His most recent book is on there. Um, I will warn you, though, and this is not a dig because I think maybe it was either his wife or his daughter. I'm not sure who it was, but it was, it is a potential female that has the same last name. And the website is gray with red lettering. <laughs> and it's a whole lot. <laughs> oh. Yeah, my eyes are squinting just thinking about it. Is, it. it is quite hard to read. And I was trying to read it on my phone. And the font was so little. It was so little. <laughs> yeah, I was really struggling. Um, my eyes. But there's a lot of information on there. There's a lot of his artwork on there. So, like, go check it out. Um it's spelled W A Y N E B A R L O W E dot com. Um, so some notable pieces of media that he's worked on: um, Blade Two, hmm. Galaxy Quest, Titan A E, which is a Don Bluth film. Hmm. Um, which I love Don Bluth, and I would really love to maybe do an episode on him because I've never like looked into his background. Yeah. That'd be cool. Um, I just really like his animation style. Mm-hmm. But Titan A.E. was one that I didn't really, I didn't watch. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think I've I... seen all of the other weird off the wall ones, but I, for whatever reason, I didn't watch Titan A.E. Yeah, I don't think you've ever uh, showed me that mm-hmm. one of all the Bluth films that we've watched together. Because I didn't, I, not being an animator, I didn't really pay attention to animation and know a lot about Bluth mm-hmm. until um, we started dating. And then you showed me and associated because I had already seen like Lamp Before Time and all that stuff. Yeah. But that's Bluth. So, and then All Dogs, which mm-hmm. All Dogs Go to Heaven, which we've seen probably three or four Can't times stop. since we've been together. And you've seen 10 times over before we were together. Movie. But, anyways, I digress. Um, Hellboy 1 and 2. Uh-huh. Um, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban and the Goblet of Fire. Um, Avatar, hmm. the big blue people, Avatar, hmm. um, and Pacific Rim, and and a lot more. Those are just the ones that like are notable to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's also done like he, and when I say he's worked on these titles, like he's worked on like um, as like either an art director or a creative director or some kind of like um, person that creates concept art for. The creatures and the landscapes and the worlds mm-hmm. that these movies and games and shows and whatever are surrounded by. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of his books, um, Expedition, uh, God's Demon, The Heart of Hell, and there's more. But the most recent publication is his art book, Psychopomp. Um, for all your hell imagery needs. Psycho pop pump. Pump. P U M P. Psycho P O M P. Oh, pump. Pump. Psycho pump. Yeah. Hmm. Um. So yeah. Again, WayneBarlow.com. You can see it all there. That's nifty. Yep. Wow. 
Um, Ian Summers, really quick, um, also a sci-fi illustrator, but an art director, creative director, artist, teacher, publisher, like anything having to do with anything creative within the art and and writing spheres, Mm -hmm. he has been a part of. Mm -hmm. Like he is just a huge name in that community. Um, He was the creative director of the creative block, creative black book. Lever Cat's Partners and Random House has won a lot of awards. The Hugo, the Nebula Best Design Book of the Year by IAGA and nominated for the American Book Award. Hmm. Um, Written and designed dozens of books, including Tomorrow and Beyond, Masterpieces of Sci-Fi Art, Mute Evidence, and The Art of the Brothers Hildebrandt. What's that? Huh? What's that? Um, I think the Brothers Hildebrandt, again, I'm not like a sci-fi novel person, Mm -hmm. um, but I think they are like Wayne Barlow, like another big name artists who have like done a ton of art and who created big name books in the sci-fi world. Mm -hmm. Oh, and he's like exhibited every single place in the world. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So like I found all of that on his Facebook um, some of it was like prompted from the like introduction of the book um, that we're talking about today. Mm-hmm. But um, then I tried to find him just through like a real simple Google search and I couldn't really find a whole lot, but also his name is really kind of like easy and popular. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did find his Facebook. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you can check him out on Facebook. <laughs> Facebook stalking it. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so anyways, let's get back to the book in Barlow's like introduction part of this book where he's kind of introducing himself and how he started this. Um, he really goes into, um, like how he really values realism when it comes to a lot of these aliens. Mm -hmm. He avoided aliens from stories that were scientific, scientifically inaccurate when it came to how our solar system works. So what that means is like if there was a book written about like life happening on like Jupiter Mm -hmm. and then we figured out that it's like a gaseous planet and like shit can't really live on Jupiter. Mm -hmm. So he, he avoided books that like did that. Mm -hmm. Um, which is rich (laughs) Mm -hmm. because there are some fucking aliens in this book that I'm like, like, yeah, fuck you for thinking that, like, we could live on Jupiter, but here is inflated asparagus with googly eyes. <laughs> it's like, where are you going to draw the line with, like, what's real and what's not? Yeah. With science fiction stuff. Yeah. <laughs> what's, the, what's the hard line where it's like, we'll, we'll do, uh, like, robotic squid monsters, but no, 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 we won't do. Uh... But they can't live on Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no. Um. Oh yeah, he kind of calls out the furry community just like a little bit. How dare he? He, he puts in quotes. Too many sci-fi writers, even the best of them, take the easy way out when creating extraterrestrials. Magic can put cats' heads on humans' torsos, but only science will describe why it's there. It's like, dude. <laughs> Wait, what? Wait. Literally, you have. There's like aliens in here. That like, are nothing. He sounds confused. I'm confused <laughs> because he sounds confused. I don't know. It's just funny. It's just funny how like serious it sounds. And then you're like, yeah, no, yeah, totally. Like that makes sense. Like that's really cool how you've like thought about this. And then you like flip through and it's like, what the fuck? Mm-hmm. Like, what are you talking about? Um, but yeah, there's interesting notes on how they thought about the evolution to the aliens based off of their biology and ecology conditions, i.e. how gravity affects them on their home planet, if they even left their home planet, how they adapted if they did, how they reproduced, and if they even breathed. Hmm. Which, all very interesting. All very interesting points to, to think about. Can you hear that tapping when... Mm-hmm. Charlie, you don't need to stop tip-tapping. Yeah, we'll close the door next time we do. We do an episode because the dog's wandering in and out. Charlie, please. Goodbye. Uh, well, yeah, if you acknowledge her, she's going to stop and just look at you. 
And now she's going to push the door open and come in yeah, anyway. Yeah, now she's going to panic. Like, the door's closed. Oh, my God. Okay. Um, because of the level of detail needed to think about these aliens in this way. <laughs> oh, they're killing me. Why, why Why? can you not hear anything else, but you can hear the faint tapping up I can there? Hear, <laughs> I can hear high frequency. Uh-huh. Like, I can't hear somebody talking in front of me, but mm-hmm. if a fork drops three rooms down, I can hear that shit. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just not meant to be present. <laughs> <laughs> I'm meant to be thinking about what's going on in the other room yeah. 24-7. Um, God, okay, let me... Let me so these guys were so involved in thinking about these aliens and all of the all of the little details that they need to think about mm-hmm. um, that it started like seeping into their like subconscious <laughs> and their brains mm-hmm. kind of like a little bit crazy. Um, there is a little like antidote in the introduction. Anecdote. Is it anecdote? Anecdote. Wow. <laughs> What's antidote? <laughs> the thing that you give your Skyrim player for like poisoning. Why in Skyrim? Why you got to call me out like that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting it in words that you can now understand. Now you got to make me feel stupid and like a weeb. Like, what do you want? Give me the antidote. Just, just I didn't say <laughs> antidote. I said anecdote. No, no. Did I say antidote? No, you're crazy. Yeah, because that's why I'm correcting you. Because <laughs> you said antidote. Can I start that over? No. <laughs> Please. I'm going to keep all this in. No, don't do that. <laughs> I don't want to sound dumb. You're not going to sound dumb. No more dumb than me. Um, so these guys were pretty obsessed about all of those little details. Um, so much to the point that it was starting to like affect them subconsciously. Um, and they were having dreams. <laughs> so in Wayne Barlow's introduction to this book, he tells a little like quick little like blip Mm -hmm. a little story of how ian summers is having some weird ass dreams (laughs) Mm -hmm. and apparently um he was he he was having dreams where he was on romantic liaisons quote unquote with the polarian female aliens which the polarian is one of the aliens listed in this book um so I was like, oh, okay, you know, like, if she's hot, like. <laughs> right. uh-huh. so... Spoiler alert, she's not. <laughs> Let me show you uh-huh. what the Polarian looks like. <laughs> and, and I will describe for the viewers at home. Yeah, because I thought, I was, like, thinking, like, oh, she's got a body, and she got titties. Body, yaddy, 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 yaddy. Yeah, yaddy, I was yaddy. like, oh, okay, like, if she's if she's pretty. Like, whatever. Like, if she got a body. This is what the Polarian looks like. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, no. Your book's falling apart. Yeah, no, that book is falling apart. Why did you rip it out of my hands like that? I didn't rip it. I just took it. Hmm. (laughs) You can read it. Like, see if if you're okay with reading it. To, To describe... Well, just, yeah, I mean, the first one gets it pretty awkwardly. I mean, it doesn't help that it looks like a sperm. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Or as this book puts it, a teardrop shape. Yeah. A teardrop-shaped entity approximately 1.8 meters tall when fully extended. That's hot. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, A muscular socket at the bottom of the body holds a large wheel. At the upper end. Oh, sorry. Holds a large wheel, period. At the upper end, the body tapers into a flexible tentacle called a trunk. But only if the polarian is male. And a tail if it's female. Which terminates in a smaller ball held in place by a similar socket. Yeah, so like... Imagine an acorn. But instead of a pointy bottom to the acorn, it's round. And then the hat of the acorn, like, imagine you, like, took the stem of the acorn and you twisted it a couple of times 
clockwise or counterclockwise and it like became more elastic as you twisted it and then there's a ball at the end oh yeah that's kind of i was thinking like if you got if you had two balls and one was really big poor way to start well that's that's the other part that's why this is so like what the fuck like it does look like a testicle it looks like a singular testicle a testy a testy <laughs> no it's like if you got two balls and you had one little ball and one big ball mm -hmm. and then you took the sleeve of a shirt mm -hmm. just like cut like a sleeve like a tube sleeve mm -hmm. and then you put one end of the sleeve on one end and then you took the other end of the sleeve and put it and put the little ball in it <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's all black so where are you gonna get to where this one's from like what story yeah it's there taylor where read well child you're <laughs> you did the research you have to tell me here i'll like, give me the book tell me tell me so this is from cluster by piers anthony cluster so there's like a whole like and of all of the creatures mm -hmm. like there's some of them that have to do with like reproduction mm -hmm. but this one has the largest paragraph purely reproduction well it looks yeah. like a testy yeah no and <laughs> it's really weird like and i'm just gonna try to breeze through this really fast but like the way that they reproduce is like so they like circle around each other and then they circle closer and closer and closer and then that like thinner ball part at the top they twist it around each other's like little trunks and whatever the other the male one is called mm-hmm so they like twist it around each other. Um, and then the like female lets go of her big ball. Mm -hmm. And then the female and the male cup the male's ball together. And then it just spins real fast. <laughs> <laughs> and then it spins. Um, and then the ball like produces the offspring. So then the offspring just like out. Mm. And then the male will, like, cup the female's ball, put it back into the female, and then the male just, like, chills until his ball grows back. I have more questions than I've been given answers. <laughs> and? <laughs> and I feel like there should be more, but I don't know where to go after that. I don't know. I just think, like, reading this, like, reading all of these little like alien things mm -hmm. the whole entire time reading the descriptions i was like how the fuck did y'all put this in a book mm -hmm. what what is this book about mm -hmm. what what is this book about mm -hmm. like how did you come up with this mm -hmm. what, like what kind of story well, did you need this creature to exist for and maybe having read it there'd be more like context for the alien I but yeah. taken out of context just in a, a picture book of here's a bunch of aliens and then to read that is kind of like, what? <laughs> what, the, what are you talking about? What is happening? So, anyways, um, I've, so, I'd like. So this this gentleman is having uh, uh, romantic liaison, yeah, type dreams with the with the test. Yeah, extraterrestrial encounters of the sexual kind. <laughs> the, the ETT, <laughs> yeah. the extraterrestrial testy. <laughs> um, which. I think it's pretty fucking weird and maybe should have been something that he should have kept himself. <laughs> <laughs> That's the part you omit from the interview. Yeah. Maybe just keep that to yourself. Can we can we take that out in post? No, 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 no. Um, no and no, like, no. I'm not here to kink shame or nothing, but like, there are just some things. Who knows? Maybe someone listening is like, oh, yeah, I'm into that. But like, here's, here's the thing though, like, and I don't mean to like be all fucking weird and like, social justice warrior about this shit i'm just mm -hmm. like the situation just like weirds me the fuck out like i just think it's hilarious because this dude was a professor mm -hmm. when wayne brought his artwork to him mm -hmm. so like he met him when he was 18 mm -hmm. and then like two years later they worked together so he's like 20 so this ian summers guy is like probably like twice his age mm -hmm. and then wayne's like drawing and painting these creatures and like Ian Summers, like, subconscious, just, like, getting off, like... His brain. <laughs> Having strange, strange thoughts. I don't know. Like, I don't mean to take it. I don't mean to take it that way. But no. at the same time, I think about it. I'm like, this is so fucking weird. No, like... people, are, people are weird. That's, like, like, walking around day to day and just looking, like... 
I doubt anyone would do it, but challenge yourself one day to just count the number of people that you encounter on a daily basis, the number of like different people. And like, whether that's actually talking to them or just like looking at them, like just acknowledge how many people there are in your path throughout the course of a single day. That's a lot of people with a lot of weird fucking thoughts in their head. Well, right. And like, I'm not I'm not trying to say that I've not had weird dreams because I've absolutely had weird dreams. That's a different podcast episode. Yeah, like the mind <laughs> goes to very weird places, but there is a time place and certain people that we can share them with. <laughs> <laughs> and in a public uh in a in a publicly available uh publication book that was that was made for young adults that was like given an award for young adults. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not the right place, not the right time. <laughs> I'm just like, what the fuck? Not the right, not the right scenario, situation. So anyways, I just thought that that was really funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of comes to the end. <laughs> funny ha-ha or funny? <laughs> funny meh, but also funny ha-ha. And okay. also this book is like how old? Like we've come really far and think very differently. Oh, yeah. Well, remember... About, like, sexuality and gender. And so there's a lot of shit in yeah. this book that you're like, ha, <laughs> no. okay for today. <laughs> well, just, like, verbiage alone. I remember uh, we were watching Grumps play Leisure Shoot Larry, or Steam Train. Uh, yeah. Leisure Shoot Larry. And all of the stuff that Dan was calling out, like, oh, <laughs> that would not fly today. today. <laughs> different time, different place. So... Now, I just want to go over some of my favorite aliens. Yeah. Alien yeah, time. we've come to, like, the end of, like, the short synapses, short history of what this book is. Yeah. Um, and now I just want to go over some aliens. But... Um, the moment you've all been waiting for. I, I do want to... And whenever we release these episodes, like, I am going to start an Instagram... Just to put pictures up of mm-hmm. the things that we are talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, this is one of them. So, like, I'm going to scan these pages. But for now, you're at the mercy of uh, yeah <laughs> of our auditory descriptions. Um, so, this one is... Oh, okay. Real, so, one more thing. The fucking names of these aliens. Like, I'm mm-hmm. sorry, but I'm not about to, like, Google each one. Like, I'm just about to, like phonetically sound this out like hooked on phonics Mm -hmm. i i don't care Mm -hmm. like (laughs) this shit is all made up anyways and if you butthurt about it like go on reddit somewhere and talk about it (laughs) so we're gonna get we're gonna get the name we're gonna get uh, a rough description of what they look like and then do you by chance have a fun fact of for each one no (laughs) (laughs) no i didn't get that far no they're just honorable mentions you look Um, sad the Anthesian from the world of the word for world is forest by Ursula K. Le Guin. Wait, what was the um, name of that book again? Huh? What was the name of that book again? The word for world is forest. Oh, gotcha. Which is very like, oh, huh. that's so beautiful. Huh. Huh. Um, Gentle Green Monkey Man, basically a gumfling. Um, and then I was like, wait. Who did it first? Mm -hmm. And so then I researched really fast. And this book came out first. Hmm. Um, So this is the OG Gelfling in my mind. Nifty. Um, Gelfling as in Gelfling from uh, the Dark Crystal. Dark Crystal, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not the Netflix series. It is the same. For all all y'all. Oh. Oh, yeah, the Netflix series. I mean, yes, the Netflix series. But but like the original movie. The original movie. Yeah. The Dark Crystal. Um... But yeah, just like little green man. And green man. He's a little hairy. Like it reminded me of like a gibbon monkey. Like they kind of sing and coo at each other. Yeah, he's got long feet too. I mean like his appendages are kind of long, uh, gibbon like, but he's got like man torso. So man imagine man torso with no neck. <laughs> <laughs> man torso, no neck, uh gibbon like appendages, whereas the where the gibbon arms lengths uh match the the lower extremity lengths as well very long legs very long arms uh as i said no neck um mutton chops yeah and he's a little sad looking he's got a bit of a frown yeah big eyes bit of a monkey face 
Like weird long hair with a very strong widow, widow's peak. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Very strong widow's peak. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very strong hairline, very sir. Strong widow's peak. Um, next one. This one's easy. This one's called. Oh, here's the uh, Gumby. The inflated asparagus oh. with googly eyes. <laughs> it does. It looks like Gumby though. Um, it looks like Gumby if his arms had like gotten caught in some like heavy machinery. Yeah. <laughs> and um, all this spindly. is called a demon. It's called a demon. Yeah, this is called the demon. Just a demon. Yeah. Um. Which I'm assuming it's just called a demon because maybe like the person who is like the main character that we're following of the story. Right. It's just what they've referenced them as. That's what I'm assuming. Yeah. 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 Um. But yeah, what did I write? Um, scary hand paw dog with a cool purse. Nope, but also he's a good boy. With a cool purse. He does have a cool he purse. He does have a cool purse, right? That's a, which, a cool harness purse. No, no, uh, we're gender, gender neutral on this one. So I wouldn't call it a purse. It's just a, uh, it's a fashionable bag. Yeah, just a cool little that purse. That he has fashioned around his chest. But he is um, like a purplish, bluish purplish mm -hmm. with... Actually, let me just um, read because the the history of it will like make sense. Mm -hmm. So the demon is from A Plague of Demons by Keith Lawmer. Mm -hmm. Physical characteristics. Demons are lean, somewhat dog-like beings, two meters in length. The demon's pale pinkish gray body is sparsely covered with short, stiff bristles. Thin fore and hind legs end in pale hand-like paws. The yellowish-white skull-like head has needle-sharp teeth, a ragged black tongue, and glowing red eyes. Demons are ferociously strong and can move on either two or four feet at a swift but awkward gait. Their earth weight exceeds 140 kilograms. Demons are oxygen-breathing beings with copper-based circulatory systems. Flesh tissue is almost crystalline, and the hair contains metallic fibers. Hmm. Danger. Danger. This is just like fiberglass the dog. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine like uh like the pink panther from the fiberglass insulation packaging, but with mange. Yes, and, and a hands skull on head. his and a skull head and <laughs> hands on his feet. Yeah. <laughs> History. The demons are the primary servants of a vast intergalactic intelligence engaged in an unimaginably ancient total war against all entities with creativity. With creatively and free will, ruthlessly logical, the demons direct an army of human intelligences, intelligences imprisoned in robot bodies. Mm. A powerful telepathic hypnosis enables them to induce humans to see them as members of their own kind. Mm. So they, lot. so they hate creativity, they hate creative thought, but they preserve the thought portion of humans and instill it into robots, robotic servants. I, yeah, I don't fucking know, dude. Like that's interesting. He was just a lot. Me thinks the demon may be a little, uh, confused perhaps. So next, a little conflicted. Um, next up is the Ishtarian. Um, before I show you, mm -hmm. I just want to read, <laughs> My little, like, descriptor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Centaur cat with plant hair. Good view of its four balls and asshole. Oh, yeah, and it's fire time, baby. <laughs> baby. Please tell me you typed multiple Ys. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> baby. This is the fire cat. <laughs> oh, no, this is the Ishtarian, not the fire cat. <laughs> I mean, it is fire cat, but what is going on there? <laughs> <laughs> We wanted to create, we wanted to show aliens that made sense ecologically, geographically, well, it doesn't, anatomically. Well, it doesn't make sense ethologically, geographically, or any of the things that you said. What is going on with that weird, like, tumor on its back? Or is that supposed to be some kind of weird, like, muscle? I think it's just because he's turning. Uh-huh. Like he's just, oh no, I think he does have a hump because look at this little. Yeah, what does that say? It's just saying that it's a male. And, and, and that's something? a female. 
It's just n- notes of different in body size and shape. So the males have like a camel uh, hump for some reason. Yeah, the males do have a hump. That's interesting. But yeah, so um, let me just, I'm just going to read this page. So the Ishtarian is from a book called Fire Time by Powell Anderson. Um, the Ishtarian, with its leonin body and nearly human torso, stands about two meters tall. The body is covered with a moss-like plant, leafy on head and mane, which le- lives in symbiosis with the Ishtarian, removing carbon dioxide and waste from the being's bloodstream and returning oxygen and vital minerals, which is really fucking cool. Mm-hmm. In addition to providing the Ishtarian with a more efficient metabolism, the symbiotic plant acts as a last resort food supply for the om- omnivorous entity. Uh, stuff about skin color uh, varies widely. Hearing is more acute. Uh, long lives ranging from 300 to 500 years. Did you say what um, what book this one was from? I did. What is it from again? Fire Time by Fire. Powell Anderson. Fire Time, baby! Fire Time! <laughs> Um, the habitat, the planet Ishtar circles the star Bell. Bell is a member of the three sun system of Anubelia. And once every thousand years, Ishtar's orbit brings it very near one of Bell's companion stars. The resulting increase in stellar radiation causes a terrible rise in the temperature of Ishtar, bringing drought, famine, and finally burning off most of the vegetation. The Ishtarians call this fire time. Baby! Baby! (laughs) Um... So, yeah, and then there's, like, a little bit about its culture, but I'm just, like, fine, whatever. <laughs> this is a lot. I don't like that. I don't like that thing. All right, let me find the next one. Oh, here he is. Um, so, the Ixchel, I-X-C-H-E-L. Um, my descriptor is nightmare buff cookie monster with no eyes, but is cool. He's super docile and smells nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And that's it. Uh He is like a male body, but with four arms, but the arms end in like tentacles Uh and he's got a head, but it's like skinned over. Like there's no eyes, no face, no nothing with little tentacles coming out. Really fucking creepy. Uh Really scary. Uh And he's all blue, but his hair, he's, he's got really like fine shaggy blue hair, Uh but he's like super chill. He's apparently like super chill. He, yeah. So I'm I'm looking at him, and it's like, um, uh, what was the what was the creature from Pan's Labyrinth with the the eyes in his hands? Oh fuck, I don't remember his name. Yeah, but imagine like his his like weird like no eyed face. But even more so because, like, there's just no, there's nothing. Yeah, nothing. So, like, nothing on the face. And then, uh, what's the, like, if General Grievous from Star Wars had tentacle arms, but he, like. I think you're just making this more confusing. No, but he fell victim to uh, the prank from that movie, Big Fat Liar, where that guy's (laughs) in the swimming pool and he turns all blue. (laughs) Like that. That's that's what I'm looking that at. <laughs> very far. Like, you have you have your 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 uh, vocabulary. Okay. I have mine. I'm gonna move on. <laughs> oh, also, uh, this creature is from A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Legal. This one's called the Puppeteer. Hmm. My descriptor is. White double sock puppet giraffe with straight cut bob wig on his back. <laughs> straight cut bob wig. Yeah, look, it's a wig. Yeah, let me see it. <laughs> yeah, it's oddly um it's oddly styled. Styled. But like obviously styled. Like someone cut that. Oh, I don't like the um, the supportive pictures that yeah, the, they have in the bottom corner. The grabby hands, the grabby sock puppet. Pu- I wouldn't call sock hands. puppet hands. The mouths of the puppeteer function as hands. The knobs illustrated. There are knobs illustrated. Are its fingers? 
Like, imagine cow udders, but able to move autonomously like an elephant trunk. It's a lot. It, It's just, I'm. whenever we decide to release this, I'll post the pictures. You can see them. Oh, when frightened, a puppeteer curls up into a little ball. No, okay. <laughs> this is something that happened to me this whole entire time reading this book. Like, I would start off and I'd be like, oh, cool, like super interesting. And then literally the last two or three sentence of each monster or of each alien is like they are super uh super aggressive and kill at at because it's like that one seems really chill puppeteers and like oh he's super cute and like he's scared and frightened but then at the end of that one it's like but they're pu- really like ruthless <laughs> puppeteers are known throughout the universe as shrewd businessmen who favorite whose favorite method of negotiating is through bra- uh, blackmail yeah <laughs> so he gonna blackmail you and if he gets a little scared while he's blackmailing you, he's going to curl up in a little ball. Yeah. Yeah. It's just weird. I, that happened to me like so many times reading this where I'd be like, oh, like cute. And then it'd be like, and they eat their young. And I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> and this one is from Neutron Star Ring World by Larry Niven. Yep. Niven. All right. Last one. And then I just want to do some quick honorable mentions the salaman by the book wild's blood empire by brian m stableford Mm -hmm. he's just a lizard man Mm -hmm. he's just a lizard man and his little picture is super cute because he's got this leaf and he's tied onto his head i would not call that cute he's cute but okay compared to all the other ones um he's the cutest um I don't know. Whatever. Anyways, <laughs> there is a really cool, um, there's a really cool, like, thing about these guys on how they, like, mature and become adults. Mm-hmm. So, I'm just going to read everything. Salamon are amphibious in- entities about 1.7 meters tall. Young salamon are pure blue, dappled with brown and green. The blue pigment darkens to nearly black as they mature. They shed their skins frequently. The salamon have a very complex life cycle, which allows them to live both on land and in water. Eggs are laid in the water encased in gel clusters. These eggs hatch into young aquatic salamon who mature as water breathers until they reach the point of metamorphosis into adults. At this time, the young salamon may choose to change either into an adult aquatic form or a juvenile air-breathing land form. If it chooses to become a land dweller, it continues to develop until it once again ch- must choose whether to metamorphose into an adult land dweller or to revert to the juvenile aquatic form. Once a salamon has chosen to change into an adult form, it can change at will from adult land dweller to adult water dweller and back. At any one time, without half the salamon, at any one time, about half the salamon population is in each form. Which I'm like, that's not fucking fair. So you can just decide to be a kid and be, like, in the water? He gets to choose. I wonder how they choose. Is it a mental thing, or do they have to, like, sacrifice a I don't know. I mean, it a sounds like part. a pretty cool, like, deal. It's like, oh, you want to be on land? Okay, give us your gills. Oh, I forgot to say my descriptor. Um, cute lizard people who get to have way too many chances at being a fish or a lizard, and that's not fair. <laughs> That's not fair. And I feel personally attacked. <laughs> so, yeah, they're cute. And basically, they're just like like cavemen. Yeah. Um, some that... honorable mentions. Um, the Ixtl. I-X-T-L. Uh-huh. It's just a penis. Ixtl. Um... <laughs> It's just a penis. With four arms and four legs. Yep. It's a penis. Yeah. Um, another honorable mention. Um, the old one from At the Man- Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft. No, oh, that's interesting. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and The Thing is in this book as well. Oh. Yeah. How was it rendered? How did they render it? Like that. <laughs> the thing. 
That's why I saw it and I was like, oh, why is it turning into a wolf? That's weird. And then I started reading it and I was like, that sounds like like the thing, the thing, like the monster from the movie, the thing. And yeah. so the book is, what's the book called? I gave you the book. What? Oh, uh, Who Goes There by John W. Campbell, a.k.a. So Don A. Stewart. That's the original name of the book that the thing is from. And then they adapted it into a movie and they called the movie the thing. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't either. So that's why I was looking at this and I was like, wait, what? So I, I did a quick Google search and was like, oh, shit. Hmm. Yeah, well, and it looks like it looks like this the book takes place on uh, a different planet. No, it's Antarctica. Terran? Terran? T-E-R-R-A-N? It says, during an exploratory expedition, Terran, T-E-R-R-A-N, scientist, discovered the remains of the thing frozen in polar ice. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I watched the thing maybe at an age that I shouldn't have. <laughs> so I don't remember a whole and lot. I haven't seen it since. I, I don't I just know that they're in Antarctica and then whenever I looked in Google like the synopsis of the book said Antarctica so I'm just like okay there were an expedition in Antarctica and they unearthed this thing and then it like came out of the like ice capsule that it was in and it morphs into things in its surroundings to like trick so it can feed and one of the things that it, it transforms into is the dog. And that's like a famous like scene of the like like mound of dog that it's turning into. Yeah, no, that's a crazy scene. Um Yeah, sorry, I was just looking at it. it says habitat here. The thing prefers an environment where the temperature is about fifty degrees C. Uh, it is not known what kind of atmosphere the thing evolved in, since it is able to alter its body to breathe any gas. From the artificial light sources built by the thing, it is assumed that it came from a planet orbiting a hot blue star. That's interesting. Which would make sense as to why it was dormant in Antarctica. If it came from a hot environment and then it can't function in a frozen environment. But then they thought it. Mm-hmm. And they let it out. Because they're dumb. It's interesting. Yeah. So that's it. Wow. Yeah. That's Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials. That's really cool. Yeah. So uh, kind of in uh, a little a little uh, what what I learned today, uh, similar to that Rodney fella who's all over Instagram, the crazy guy that's been quoted as um, he talks like he was kicked in the head by a horse. What are you talking about? <laughs> People that know will know, but he, um, he's the guy that says, you know, you can just do stuff, right? Oh, <laughs> they, they, uh, they had an idea for a book, uh, Wayne and Ian Barlow and Summers. They were like, you know, we can just do stuff, right? <laughs> and they did. They just did stuff. So very cool. Yep. I had a good time researching that. It was yeah. a lot of fun. Going through each of the animals. That's a good... Animals. Um... <laughs> Alien. <laughs> These are animals. animals. Yeah, we'll have to look for the uh, Ixel Gagala uh, yeah. uh, next time we're at the uh, Ashboro Zoo. That's good. Yep. I had a lot of fun. Well, oh, to, well then to shift from a uh, uh, mound of gross doggies to our own doggies. That is... Quite an awful a, segue. A poor segue. <laughs> it was a really bad segue. I had to do it somehow. Um, so we've got uh, we've got doggy horoscopes. Yeah, let's do doggy horoscopes. Doggy, doggy horoscopes. Do you have? I do. I've already got it pulled up. Okay, look pull at me. Up. I was ahead of the curve. Okay. <laughs> um. So Charlie and Mela are two puppers. Um, Charlie is an Aries and Mela is a Sag. She's a Sagittarius. We think Charlie is an Aries. Yeah, we know Mela's birthday, but, um. Charlie was a rescue. 
and yeah. we didn't even know how old she was when they found her. Uh-huh. We're assuming six months, so we went six months back, and we we kind of thought that maybe Aries, the Aries time, was when she was born. I mean, all of her descriptors that I've looked up thus far, pretty in prepping for doggy horoscopes, are pretty spot on. Yeah, pretty spot on. Huh, Charlie's. Yeah, here she is, right on cue. All right, Charlie, here's your horoscope. So this is uh, this is a weekly. So the week of the September fourth through whatever the tenth, I guess. Um, who loves you the most, BB? <laughs> what? Wait, where did you get this from? Oh, and to clarify, <laughs> <laughs> these are all coming from Teen Vogue. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, who loves you the most, BB? BB. BB. It's me. Uh, it's your mama. Actually, the answer is you in all caps. Oh, Charlie, you love yourself? The answer is you. So although the journey towards self-love uh, wasn't as hard as it is for others, you're fully embracing your awesome and fabulous sentiments. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a minute since uh, you've been feeling yourself. So make this week one for the books. Treat yourself to something nice, fun, and delicious. After oh. all, you deserve it, and it's meaningful to you because it shows how far you've come and where you're going. And more importantly, it's the joy and care you have for the most special person you know. That's me. Charlie, are you going to treat yourself by finding something in the garbage without me or dad knowing? <laughs> yeah, probably. If she hasn't already, well, we've been she back said, here recording. Treat yourself by eating garbage. Mm-hmm. Huh, Charlie? You're so silly. She wants so bad to know what we're doing. She's so confused. She's like, why are you guys back here? All right. And then uh, Mela's. So Sagittarius for uh, the same week, this week. Uh, Amelia's so far has been kind of like, oh. Oh, really? Yeah, because the last one we did was kind of like, oh. Um, Disagreements with friends have hit a high. (laughs) Amelia doesn't have any friends (laughs) other than Charlie. Um, Causing you to run away from the problem at hand. And before you disappear and disengage from the situation, consider making amends with them. It doesn't matter who's wrong and who's right in this matter, since you both played a heavy hand in escalating the drama and taking it to the next level. If you don't know what to say after the argument or feel uncomfortable, try sending your besties an olive branch in the form of a cute emoji or funny joke to get the conversation started and to make up. Oh. Yeah. So you think Mela's upset with us? I think we need to get Mela a cell phone so that she can send cute emojis. No, like, okay. So Mela's like circle mm-hmm. is me, you, and Charlie. Mm-hmm. Do you think Mela is like angry at us? I don't think. I don't Do think you she's think angry Mela at me. Mela has like beef. I don't think she's got beef with me. I she's haven't done anything. Here. Yeah. I mean, she's, she's upset. <gasps> she's upset because <laughs> Charlie is in here with us. Well, Charlie's. Coming in and out on her own fruition. Mela is asleep in our bedroom on her doggy bed. Mela, you do it to yourself. She does. <laughs> you could be in here. You could have everything. Yep. It's, uh, well, and it says, before you disappear and disengage from the situation, consider making amends with them. Mela, we are here for you. She's in her head a lot. Be a little brat. She's not, she's not considering <laughs> making amends. She's just going to be salty. So... There's the doggy horoscopes. And if you're a doggy out there, <laughs> take, take those words to heart. <laughs> if you happen to be a, an, Aries, Vogue, an where... Aries doggy or a Sagittarius doggy. Yeah, Teen Vogue, where we get all of our very accurate horoscope. For dogs. For dogs. <laughs> For dogs only. Yes. Well, that's about it. Yeah. Anything else? I don't think so. Are you sure? Yep. I don't have anything else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Why am I forgetting something? I don't know. Are All you? right. I'm going to go now. Bye. What if I just didn't say, <laughs> say anything on the send off? You can't do <laughs> you that can't. to people that listen. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really annoying. <laughs> Goodbye.
Congrats on making it to the end of the episode. Why don't you give us a follow wherever you're listening and maybe even leave a review. Put in a good word with the algorithm, you know? For picture references and other general content related to the pod, you can follow our social accounts at the dog hair is free on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube. Subscribe to get notifications when we post new episodes, but otherwise we're targeting releases every other week, so hopefully more frequently in the future. And again, thanks for your time. The dog hair is free. Is free. Is free.